Good evening. We are happy you are all here tonight. Uh, before we begin our meeting, we will have a word of prayer offered by Council Member Hens. If you'll pray with me. Father, we welcome your presence. Jesus, Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place. We want to walk wisely as stewards of this magnificent community. So would you come and dwell in our midst, be ever present. Let us feel your presence. Let us have eyes to see and ears to hear. We want to be a city on a hill, one that is set apart from all the other communities in Texas, one that walks um, and advances your kingdom and sees destruction overturned, sees the kingdom of darkness overturned, sees poverty turned around and health issues. Healing brought to those. And so we welcome you and we say yes to everything you have. Please give us wisdom and favor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. So I'd like to call the meeting of September 3rd, 2019 to order. Uh, and first, uh, we have community recognitions. So tonight, we are going to uh, an award, a, an, a, a community recognition. We're going to recognize the Blue Star Mothers Group. So if I could have all of them join me that are here tonight, and there may even be you have any men in your group yet? There you go. <laughs> yeah, you all. Yeah, come on up here. Uh, this group, uh, and I will let them uh, talk a little bit about what they do, but it's more than just mothers. And this group was recently formed. We have not had this group, uh, and it was formed this year for our community, and we are so grateful uh, for that. Um, does she need a microphone? Jan, or yes or no? Okay. I can get her one. I didn't. Your voice carries. Your voice carries? Okay. <laughs> well, this is Kim McDonald, and she is president and was instrumental in getting this group started. So I'm going to let her tell a little bit about this group, if you don't mind. Uh, we're the Blue Star Mothers of America. We're the Piney Woods chapter. <coughs> what we are are a 501c3 veteran service organization. We support our military. Our name is a little deceiving because we are not just mothers. It's our membership is open to anyone who wants to support our, member, our uh, veterans and our active military. We all have children who are currently serving or who have served. What we do is we just send out our first care packages to the troops. We're here for them when they're deployed. We're here for them when they come back. And we're here for each other. The main thing that I tell my moms and my dads and my supporters is no matter where you are in your military journey, someone in this group has been through it, is going through it, or will go through it. So we've got you covered. Great. Well, thank you so much, Kim. And on behalf of the city, I would like to give this to your club, reminiscent of our downtown brick streets, and so that you, when you look at it or anyone in your group looks at it, they are reminded um, of a grateful city. So thank you. Now, if council will come join me for a photograph. Yeah. We'll squeeze in. Squeeze, 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 squeeze. All people on the bench. Not that. Well, we don't get there. Come on. Here's a tall one. The next item on our agenda is our open forum. Uh, the open forum is the public's opportunity to address council on any matter related to the city that is not on the agenda. Our rules and procedures for council meetings apply to the open forum and include disrupting a public meeting as a violation of state law and no cursing is allowed. 
Your comments are limited to three minutes. In accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, City Council generally cannot discuss, consider, or take action on matters not listed on the agenda. So the first person that we have signed up this evening is Mary McKenna. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for letting me come and speak. Uh, this is three minutes for me to just ask your blessing on my endeavors here in Nacogdoches, that I'll be able to become prosperous and, and grow uh, businesses, employment, make community ties, have friends, and settle down and have a great life. Um, I have recently returned after having um, a series of setbacks, and so I just came to the council tonight to let you know that you know, enough setbacks. <laughs> I'm ready to move forward to be respectful, to be helpful, and to be able to you know, just have good vibes, you know, be positive. And so I ask the same in respect. And um, I look forward to all kinds of good that I see that we can do and um, have a great, have a great time. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I'm supposed to ask you if you would table this for the next meeting so that I can receive the blessing the next meeting or whenever you choose. Okay, we will have staff look at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay, uh, Russell Sanders. Good evening. Good evening. Russell Sanders. I live in here in court, resident of Ravencroft subdivision forever. And I appreciate you allowing me to come up and visit with you tonight. I recently sent y'all a letter regarding a bunch of different topics and tonight I'd like to just uh, follow up on that. Uh, people tend to cringe, blow up, want to fight when somebody mentions bond issues and taxes or raising taxes and that's something that we really need to face. It's too late this year to do it but in the next year some things need to be looked at. Uh, every for years, things have been put on the back burner. And for some reason or another, they never get brought to the surface. And every year, it just gets worse. And every year, the costs go up. At some point in time, somebody's going to have to say, okay, we need to get after this. Um, a lot of these things that are needed probably going to need a bond issue, possibly. I'm not a financial person, but you can probably look at that. Um, as I mentioned in the letter, fire stations and utility infrastructure are two of the big ticket items that I can see that probably need to be addressed in some of this. Over, year, over the years, things have changed in the way that the streets, the roads, the water, everything, and the fire stations probably need to be relocated, uh, possibly have less stations if they're better located. All this was set up on the old key rate system. Uh, fire, fee, fire response vehicles and personnel are very important items. As a side thing, in 67 or 68, I was working at Fire Station 2 on East Main, driving a 1951 Ford booster truck that we had to push out of the fire station to get it cranked. And Mr. George Grimes, who lived just down the road, his house caught on fire. He ran up there and jumped on the side of the truck, and I said, help push. <laughs> and he helped push the truck out of the station. We popped the clutch, and he jumped on and went to his house fire. Right after that, we got a new fire truck. But you can't wait that long for stuff to happen. All the fire stations and all the fire equipment in the world cannot put out a fire. It takes manpower. And right now, we have two to three firefighters assigned to a truck. You need a four-man minimum to once they get to the fire where they can go into operations. If you don't have that, and that's one of the things that used to keep me up as fire chief at night, if you don't have the proper manpower, when they get there, they're going in defensive mode, which means they're going to save the well and the mineral rights on a lot of fires. If you've got more manpower, they can go to work 
on a bunch of fire attack, go in, get people out, try to minimize damage. But I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next agenda item is uh, items to be removed from the consent agenda. If there's anything council has a question or concern about, and if not, chair would entertain a motion for approval. I'll make a motion we approve the consent agenda. I'll second that. Okay, moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. Regular agenda, we will start with a public hearing on our proposed tax rate. Mr. Jeffers? Thank you, Madam Mayor, City Council, and as we did at the last public hearing, I'm going to run through information for the tax rate as well as the budget since they're all tied together, and then you'll have your public hearing separately on the tax rate and then the proposed budget. But just a reminder that the city of Nacogdoches is a municipal corporation. When we look at operating expenses, depreciation, capital improvements, and debt, you're uh, responsible as a city council for in excess of $73 million of expenditures. We have 324 employees of which we could do nothing without those employees. I know a lot of times we don't think about all the services that the city provides, uh, but it is quite extensive from public safety, water, sewer, library, uh, an airport, trash removal, um, I'll even say legal, even though no <laughs> one gets excited about the legal uh, department. When we look at the general fund, we have total proposed expenditures of a little bit in excess of $26 million. Uh, in the area of general fund proposed capital improvements, it's a very modest $1.1 million. Uh, we need to have a new asphalt truck for our street paving program. That comes in at $220,000. <coughs> You can see that we have uh, street rehab, uh, $250,000 that's coupled with the $5 street maintenance fee, uh, which pulls the number up uh, around a million dollars worth of uh, street improvements in the upcoming fiscal year. Um, Festival Park restroom, $210,000 bothers me a little bit that a restroom costs more than a house, but that is uh, important in order to build a structure that is going to withstand public use. And so these structures are intended to last 50 years uh, plus. And general fund proposed capital uh, expenditures. Uh, the large ticket item is $400,000 for uh, six patrol cars. Looking at operational revenues for the general fund, property tax is the big generator followed by sales tax and then the 21% uh, interfund transfer from the sanitation and utility fund. I will mention at this point that we said that we would give the council a target for what might be a best practice on interfund transfers. We're still working on that number and we'll have it by the next council meeting. Um, pretty confident that you're not going to be able to do anything this fiscal year to address it, but by having a target that's a starting point uh, for future councils to consider making interfund transfers maybe a little bit more balanced. Looking at operational expenditures, 79% of our cost goes to personnel services. That's that 320 plus employees that we were talking about earlier. When we look at expenditures by function, public safety, police, fire, animal control receives 59% of all expenditures from the general fund. That's not unusual when you consider that the majority of our employees are in those public safety uh, departments, and that's where the majority of our money goes for our operations. Uh, 
uh, general fund personnel change. We're talking about adding a budget analyst in the finance department for $57,000 plus dollars and a animal shelter a kennel attendant for $36,600 on the budget analyst. As we mentioned at the last meeting, that's actually an item which in all probability is going to save money. They serve as an internal auditor, and so our departments will be audited internally to make sure that they are complying with the wishes of the city council and implementing their budgets correctly. Property tax, we have an assessed value of a little bit over $1.7 billion. That includes uh, almost $5 million of new construction which generates an additional $31,000 per year. The proposed tax rate for the upcoming fiscal year is 61.4 cents. That is a slightly lower than the existing tax rate, but then we need to talk about the effective tax rate. The effective tax rate generates the same amount of money next fiscal year as this fiscal year, less new construction, and so when you take that into consideration, um, it is a four cent tax rate increase. Uh, a lot of this is being driven by the reappraisals, uh, which is an increase of about 7%. That's going to generate an additional $772,000 per year during the upcoming fiscal year when the council considers salary increases. Those salary increases will ba be based on salary survey those salary increases in all probability will not be possible without the tax rate increase as well as there are some other uh, items that gives the council a little bit more leeway uh, in the upcoming fiscal year to address new programs or equipment that might break down. When we look at average property tax, the average assessed value is a little bit over $86,000. That means that the tax increase on an annualized basis is a little bit over $33 or $2.77 uh, per month. We have provided the council with additional information showing what that tax increase is from a home of $50,000 all the way up to a home of a half a million dollars. Looking at the proposed budget in the utility fund, we see uh, proposed operating expenditures of 15, uh, almost $16 million. Uh, the operational revenues in the utility fund, they're split pretty evenly between water charges and sewer charges. The utility fund is an enterprise fund, therefore it lives uh, off of what it kills, water and sewer rates. Doesn't receive any tax money for their operations, uh, therefore it's run more like a traditional business, private business, than, um, than what our general fund is. Utility fund proposed expenditures by uh, department. Um, debt service is 26%. There's the inner fund transfer to the general fund of 25%. Water production is 16% and wastewater treatment is 14%. Uh, Yay. Uh, proposed fee changes on the water rates. There is no increase in water rates in the upcoming fiscal year for residential customers. We do see an increase of $2.89 uh, per thousand gallons to $3.09 per thousand gallons for our industrial customers. Uh, sewer rates, uh, there is no rate change for the upcoming fiscal year, and there is no uh, proposed increase in the set sanitation rates for the upcoming fiscal year. The utility fund proposed capital expenditures, uh, you know, the large item down at the near the bottom, capital improvements for water distribution and wastewater distribution is almost $5 million, and that does not address uh, potential needs for replacing the Bonita and the Lanana sewer trunk mains. That will be a discussion that will come before the council later after the adoption of the budget 
and to look to see if we can find a financing mechanism to move those important projects forward. Utility fund, personnel changes, uh, all of these are done with the shifting of monies in-house. These are not new expenditures, but uh, the important item or the new item there is a GIS technician in the utility construction department, which is critical for mapping purposes. Sanitation fund proposed budget. We have proposed operational expenditures of about $4.6 million. Uh, sanitation fund proposed operational revenues. The bulk of that comes from the sanitation charges of 80% uh, and landfill gate receipts uh, at 9%. Sanitation fund proposed expenses by department, interfund transfer, uh, the dollar amount is the same as a utility fund, but since you're dealing with a smaller fund, then the percentages are higher. Sanitation uh, collection, uh, that's what we pay on our monthly bills, is 23%, uh, and then disposal, which is the landfill, is at 18%. Classification um, expenses in the sanitation fund, there's that interfund transfer again. Personnel expenses are 25%. Contractual services are at 14%. Sanitation fund uh, proposed capital improvements. The uh, large ticket item is two garbage trucks for $660,000. And then looking at our budget calendar where we're at the September 3rd, the second of two public hearings. And then the council will be considering the adoption of the budget, including the uh, tax rate, at the September the 17th meeting. And at the September 17th meeting, in essence, that is a final opportunity for the public to comment, even though it's not scheduled for public hearing. It is the policy of the council to allow public comment. Uh, Madam Mayor, I'll step aside so that you can have your public hearing on the proposed tax rate and then the public hearing on the uh, proposed budget and then I'll return for Q&A. Okay, so our first public hearing is on uh, the proposed tax rate. So is there anyone here that is, would like to speak against the proposed tax rate? Nope. Anyone want to speak for it? Yes, sir, please come forward. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Sean Dillon. Um, I am uh, the president of the Nacogdoches Professional Firefighters Association. I've been with the city uh, fire department here for 17 years. And first, I just wanted to thank you uh, as a council for your support. Uh, earlier this year, the council approved a cost of living adjustment for city employees, which we are very much grateful and appreciative for. Um, as you know, the fire department, like other city departments, has uh, aging apparatus, equipment, buildings, and uh, each year uh, the cost of items, uh, including apparatus, and the maintenance increases. Um, the proposed budget funds uh, some of the needed upgrades for fire and rescue services, but not nearly all of them. Uh, we would just like to say thank you for considering approval of the increased tax rate, uh, without which we will fall further behind in our ability to protect our citizens and visitors. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak for? Yes, sir. Please come forward. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. My name is Jonathan Adams. I'm a detective with the police department. I've been employed with the city for 20 years. Um, I wanted to, to thank you guys for your support of the police department that we've received over the years. Um, you know, we've received some salary adjustments or salary increases over the past 18 months, and they're greatly appreciated and they were greatly needed. Um, as you've been told in the past, those kind of help close the gap a little bit when comparing us to similar sized cities. And uh, I wanted to kind of, several of you were not on the council or haven't been on the council very long, and I wanted to kind of give you just a brief history, and this is from a, an employee, a, a rank and file employee's perspective of things. 
Uh, we went through a, a kind of a rough patch between, I'd say, around 2008 to 2017, where we uh, we did receive three small cost of living increases. For me personally, it was less than two dollars an hour over that uh, the span of that nine or ten years. Uh, on two occasions, we went three years in a row with nothing. Would get a little bump, and then three more years, and then we went through a two-year stretch, and it was uh, it was really tough. Uh, all of our expenses, you know, I, I'm, we have bills uh, at our houses just like everybody else, and it's hard to to not see any kind of cost of living adjustment when your cost of living's going up. So um, it, it looks like things have started to turn around, and we're grateful of that. Um, you know, with that, we we're competing with a lot of different police departments and with recruiting and retention and it affects morale you know these guys we all have a have a very tough job a lot of what you see in the paper the pictures of high-fiving kids at the elementary school that's the fun stuff but there's a lot of bad stuff that you uh that people just don't realize we have to deal with and it's hard to keep people wanting to come to work and stay at stay with us when things get kind of stagnant but i'm not here to to complain i just wanted to kind of give you a background and give you my perspective on this um, another thing that you may or may not be aware of is, you know, the, the city has a longevity uh, pay in place that for the first 10 years of your employment, you get a little bump every year. Well, when you hit that 10, you're maxed out, and now you're at the mercy of the city administration finding room in a budget to, to give a cost of living adjustment um, and for the council to approve it. So, uh, you know, I, I couldn't give you a percentage of how many guys at our office are over, over 10 years, but there's quite a few and uh, it just it makes it kind of tough knowing that, well, maybe maybe we can find a find room for it, maybe not. Um, all of us work a lot of extra jobs. Don't really want to. I'd rather be at home with my kids, but you know we have to do what we have to do. So um, I'm not here to to ask you to raise taxes. I'm not here to ask you for a raise. That'd be out of line of me. It's not my place. I just I wanted you to hear from just a regular longtime city employee kind of a, a little brief history and, and let you know that we, we appreciate the last 18 months has been um, it's been really nice and, and knowing that uh, okay they recognize and folks recognize that we need to help them out and uh, hopefully we can find a way to kind of close the gap between our department and some other uh, other departments that are similar to us so thank you very much for your time thank you. thank you is there anyone else that would like to speak for the proposed tax rate None. Public hearing is closed. Uh, now we will open the public hearing for the proposed 2019-2020 budget. Is there anyone that would like to speak against something in the proposed budget? Okay. Is there anyone here that would like to speak for? Yes. Good evening. Hello. Mayor Brophy, all council members, uh, thank you all for letting me come speak. I'm, I'm Ron Collins, uh, a citizen of Nacogdoches, but also I've come tonight uh, representing NEDCO as the treasurer of NEDCO. And I uh, just wanted to thank you first for the uh, support that you have provided us in the past. I think we all know that uh, our budget contains about $95,000 uh, that is provided to NEDCO for a portion of what uh, money that we spend to operate our office. Uh, of that uh, total budget is about 325000 uh, so it represents about 30% of the budget that we have uh, to operate our office. I want to thank you and ask you for your continued support of that money. Uh, it is highly critical for the office to have it. It's really difficult to even consider uh, the things that we do today without all of our funding, and that represents, as we have already said, you know, a substantial part. So it is very uh, important to have it. Um, we, uh, we look forward to continuing to develop uh, uh, economic uh, things in Nacogdoches. Uh, it's very critical, I think, for us right now, especially we've got a lot of great things kind of on the cusp. Some have already happened. Uh, some are yet to come. But we do need our uh, economic development uh, operation uh, in full force to try to take advantage of all the things that uh, the good things that we see coming up think down the pipe with I-69 and some of the other things that uh, uh, 
are going to be happening over the next few years. So with that, um, I'll just conclude, but I do want to say thanks again for the support that you have provided us in the past, and certainly would uh, ask that you continue to support us uh, as the proposed budget uh, provides. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak for the proposed budget? Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Mayor Brophy, members of the council. My name is Steve Davidson. I'm president of the Boys and Girls Club here in town. Uh, just wanted to take a moment. I'm here representing uh, not only myself and the organization, but also Brian Krennic and Betty Shin, who are longtime um, board members and supporters of the club here locally. Uh, I wanted to just take a moment to thank the council uh, for their continued support to the club recognizing the importance and the impact that the Boys and Girls Club does have in our community. Uh, we hope to continue to grow what we've had in the last couple of years that we've been here, continue to grow our partnerships with uh, the public entities, with the school district, uh, with the service groups here. Uh, but I really wanted to just take a, a moment to, to thank you for continuing to support this public-private partnership that we have between the city and the Boys and Girls Club. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else here that would like to speak for the proposed budget? Okay. None. Public hearing is now closed. Uh, council, any questions or concerns for Mr. Jeffers on either the proposed tax rate or the proposed budget? I just I have a curiosity question, but before that I wanted to thank Mr. Dillon and Detective Adams for providing um, that perspective, I think that people generally, when they hear tax increase, you just immediately don't like it, but that definitely puts a face um, and an importance to it. So thank you guys for coming and, and speaking. Um, for the patrol cars, I'm just just curious, are they the, the Tahoes or the, the sedans, yes, the Tahoes? Um, just curiosity, why are those um, better? You know, it's if they are. well, uh, they, they are, but what's rather peculiar is they get better gas mileage hmm. than the old police package sedans uh, do. They last longer. Uh, they have a better warranty. And when the vehicles first came out, I think that we were all skeptical, including the police chief, and we gave it a try and they have performed better than what we expected and they do perform better than what the old police uh, package sedans had performed. We can provide uh, documentation uh, on that information if the council is uh, interested. No, I believe, yeah. I was just wondering. <laughs> no, it's interesting to see. <laughs> I, I would be kind of curious to see what, what kind of accounting practices we have for the depreciation. Is that over a five-year term? And typically we're paying uh, 400000 divided by six. You know, and then what, what do we end up selling or what is the disposal, um, the income we get from that typically? Just yeah, typically we use straight line uh, depreciation. And uh, Ms. Kerbo, can you tell us, our chief, what we get for when we sell our... Oops. What, what about um, what we get for the sale of those vehicles? I do not know that. I'll we'll get it for you. Okay. That'd be great. You were kind of choked up. When you said that. <laughs> <laughs> about the Tahoe. <laughs> okay. Any other concerns, questions, clarifications? Yeah, just one quick thing. The six cent uh, budget is for highways, is that utilities re relocations? Where'd you see the number? In your presentation. I know. <laughs> <laughs> was, was that on one of the graphs? Yeah, one for of the six percent. Yeah. Uh, no, that's what we're spending on um, on uh, highway expense versus the twenty six million dollars that we have, but that's for the general fund and it doesn't include the street maintenance fund. Right, yeah, I figured it was different, but I wasn't sure. It's a higher number once you add in the street maintenance fund. 
but it's accounted for differently. It's that dead gum governmental accounting. Okay, thank you. I got one more. Um, what's the debt service? Twenty six percent from the utility fund expenses. What does debt service mean? Uh, it's money that we borrowed to okay. um, put in water and sewer lines, uh, maybe improvements to the wastewater treatment plant or the water treatment plant. We can give you uh, a detailed breakdown as to what that debt is and the amortization for it. It'll make your head hurt. No More. thanks. No, thank you. No. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm done. Okay. Is that it? And Madam Mayor, if I may mention that you gave me some uh, homework and remind you that a new uh, brush truck and the operations uh, cost $5 million, or maybe I did that wrong. Uh, never mind, forget that number. Uh, a brush truck, if we were to um, assign a dollar amount for a monthly rate increase, dollar fifty a month. And that only goes to residential customers because the brush truck only runs for residential uh, customers. Street sweeper, $75 <laughs> a month. So that's what type of increase you would be um, looking at. Me personally, I don't recommend either one of those two alternatives. One of the issues that we talk about with the street sweeper is getting the greenery, greenery out of the curb line, the weeds and the grass. Uh, so we are exploring contracting out uh, uh, spraying herbicides to control that growth. That's what the highway department does. And we found out that more and more cities are going to, are contracting that out. Um, we have difficulty in finding people who can pass the certification, certification test, and it's Yes, we have bright people and they're talented, but the certification test for spraying uh, herbicides is uh, quite challenging. Um, and so it may just make more sense to contract that out. We're still working on some numbers and we'll have that to you at the next council meeting. And so actually this is an item that we will probably resolve and um, don't think that we'll have a number for you to plug into the budget. Um, but possibly a budget amendment, budget amendment during the uh, winter months when it's not needed. Um, and then also the alternative to the brush truck, we talked about using technology. We have a recommendation from our IT department for an application, $15,000. There are some incidental costs that would go along with this for iPads with air cards so that our crews that are in the uh, out on the roadways uh, will be able to track these work orders and take care of them. But what this will do, it will allow uh, Council Member Bolden to report that he has brush to be picked up in front of his house, comes to the city, gets routed, and then we should be able to pick that up more quickly instead of meandering up and down every street and taking a couple of weeks to get over, over town. Um, and then also, if you want to report a pothole, then uh, uh, Council Member Anderson, you'll be able to, to do that with this application. Uh, tree limbs, um, we've, we get to customize it for what it is that we, we want. And we think that this particular software that IT has found is robust and would be able to do the job. And if it works, then I don't think that we would need another brush truck. And there's the old-fashioned way, pick up the phone and call. If we inform the public that we're no longer going to pick up brush on a patrol basis and that you got a call or report it via the app, then we'll become much more efficient. And uh, we'll monitor that carefully. And if it doesn't work, then we will hear from the citizens. But the $15,000, I'm going to plug that in to the budget. And on spraying weeds, I don't, I'm not going to commit that we'll have 
a number, but uh, that's not critical since we're getting into the, the fall, winter months. Uh, but we'll have it shortly thereafter, and if the council's interested, then budget amendment, call for bids, um, award a contract, and then we're good for spraying for weeds in the, in the curb line. You're okay? shaking your pen, <laughs> sir. No, is it okay if I ask him a question? Absolutely. Okay. Go right ahead. On the spraying the weed, and if we would have employees sitting there certified, would we have to buy equipment to do the spraying, or is it already available? We have equipment already uh, available. Um, you know, there are shields, guards to where mm -hmm. you can spray during uh, windy conditions. Uh, but I think everybody knows that if you're spraying a herbicide, that every now and then we're going to be buying uh, some shrubbery in somebody's yard or paying to lay down <coughs> sod. That's just part of what goes along with those type of operations. But you know, for as long as I've done it, the most effective way to uh, control that greenery coming up in the curb line is with a herbicide. As we discussed at the last meeting, a street sweeper cannot cut and remove that greenery that is in that curb line. It helps, but it doesn't eliminate it. And if you'll notice that the highway department has a very robust program of course, they're tooling down the highway, um, and and there's nothing in sight, and they're sterilizing an area uh, 12, 24 inches behind the pavement. We're not talking about doing that. We're talking about putting it down in the curb line where the asphalt meets the concrete. And, but the state, they use a specialized truck, right? Yes. W would we have to purchase a no, we're talking about contracting it out is what we would like okay, to explore. Okay, but if you don't contract out, we would have to purchase that equipment, right? Uh, we have some equipment. I've seen some people do it as successfully driving down the road, hanging out uh, so. um, with, with their arm dangling with a spray and with a little shield on it. And so I, I don't recommend that. I don't think that's sophisticated enough to uh, uh, stop overspray. Uh, but yes, there is some equipment that you can buy to retrofit, retrofit a pickup, uh, or you can buy a specialized unit. These companies that we are, in all probability, would be interested in bidding, they're going to have the specialized equipment, and they're doing work for um, TxDOT and, and not just um, the city of Nacogdoches. But we'll have more information for you on that sooner rather than later. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, going back to the brush truck and using the application, is there any rough idea how much um, the use of the application um, could potentially save in, in uh, manpower and fuel cost? It's intuitive, council member. Um, it's kind of hard to um, to count, I know, or, or to generate, be mindful that when we have a storm and we have an abundance of brush, then we put a second truck out, yeah. even if we have to put a front end loader with a dump truck. So there's still going to be those uh, occasions. Um, but when you think about uh, as you drive home and you look at how much of your ride home has no brush well we're driving down that street looking for brush that doesn't exist and like I said it just it just doesn't make sense it's served us well for I don't know how many years uh, but the time has come to apply this technology and we are getting complaints as you know about hey it's taking too long for you to pick up my brush now we have some and when the brush goes out, they want it picked up within 24 hours. That's not going to happen. Uh, it could, but in all probability, um, 
72 hours, maybe a week, and sometimes depending upon how heavy it is, it's going to take longer. Also, with the reporting, the routing of the pickup is going to be critical. So if we have one load of brush in one part of town isolated all by its little lonesome, it's probably going to take longer to get over there and pick it up because we're going to run these higher routes, but we'll try to age uh, the account as to how long the brush has been there and say, okay, if it's out there uh, for 10 days or 14 days or 7 days, whatever, then we will make an exception and go out and pick that up even though it's not along uh, a route that makes sense. There's some science that goes into this, and uh, we have people that are smart enough to uh, figure out the science. It's not much different than scheduling routes for picking up trash. Uh, if they're not efficient, then we waste a lot of time. We've got to have more trucks. And uh, Kerry uh, Walker in Public Works, he understands that. He's done an extraordinary job. He's rescheduled our trash truck routes at least once and um, he's going to be able to figure out something that works if we give this uh, brush truck technology an opportunity to work. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you, Mr. Jeffers. Thank you. Agenda item number eight is a public hearing uh, considering uh, ordinance amending portions of Chapter 18 dealing with food trucks. And Ms. Mahaffey's not here, so we will have a brief presentation. By Mr. <laughs> Mayor Brophy, council members, <laughs> I am not Dr. Amy Mahaffey, communications and Main Street director, but a very sorry substitute in the form of one Jeff Davis city attorney. Um, uh, at the threat of somebody to my immediate right and your left, I will attempt to be brief uh, in talking about food trucks. But just just very briefly, um, uh, just a brief summary or history of how we've arrived at tonight, as, as you may recall, and I think we have uh, several new council members since uh, there was a very large rewrite of our food truck or mobile food unit operations uh, ordinance that's located in Chapter 18. That was back in 2017. As is often the case, when we have a major rewrite of a section of our code, uh, things do present themselves that might need some amendment, uh, and there are actually four different areas that are proposed for amendment. Um, in February of this year, earlier this year, there were four different uh, sections that were presented at that meeting. It was very well attended. Uh, there was a great deal of comment. Uh, the proposed ordinance was actually tabled uh, for further discussion and public hearing. Uh, we have since that time had uh, additional comment. We actually had a uh, public hearing uh, that was held back in July, earlier this summer. Very, very well attended. Um, I think that there were a lot of questions that were surrounding those four different areas of proposed amendment that uh, were addressed, and I think uh, people were able to, to have their questions answered. I'd also be remiss if I didn't thank uh, one John Fleming, our county attorney, who so graciously uh, uh, gave of his time to moderate that. It was a very successful, uh, very productive meeting. So that's where we find ourselves, and that's how we arrived um, at our uh, present ordinance tonight. Um, let's see, I have a PowerPoint. Okay. Um, it appears from the PowerPoint that uh, when we address the first issue for amendment, uh, that's located in Section 18-58 concerning permits and applications. Uh, essentially what this would do is there's a laundry list of things there. Uh, this actually addresses um, permitting processes on city-owned property, um, and this allows for the city manager uh, to regulate those uh, hours of operation. Uh, and we believe this will make for a more fair system, provide for more rotation, and more possibilities for owners of food trucks to circulate in and out. And I bet there's another slide, and there is. Um, <laughs> With regard to the second area of amendment um, in uh, Chapter 18 or Section 18-59 concerning mo mobile food unit zoning uh, and location, uh, this addresses, I think we have a couple of areas within this section, if, if I'm correct, that we're amending. One is to remove the 200-foot uh, prohibition from the property line or the, the, the location of a fixed uh, location or restaurant. 
uh, is, has been discussed. Uh, there's been litigation across the nation, actually uh, several instances in Texas where um, constitutional challenges have actually been levied um, on this particular matter uh, concerning uh, that prohibition. So this would propose taking out that 200-foot uh, buffer area, uh, as we might call it. Um, with regard also in Section 18-59, uh, a third area of amendment would be uh, the inclusion of snow cone vendors uh, with regard to their area of operation and uh, a stationary location. Uh, there's other things that go into the number of hours of operation uh, during the day, consecutive days uh, that are already addressed, but this would uh, give a little greater detail uh, to make sure that it includes uh, mobile snow clown vendors. And then there's the fourth area, and there's the last slide I bet, uh, addresses Section 18-60, uh, and this is, a, this is a health safety welfare issue. I mean, it just makes good common sense. So what this essentially says, if I have Jeff's Barbecue Boutique or Wagon or whatever I call it, uh, and I have a fire pit on it, um, I would not be able to locate uh, or position my food truck uh, within 10 feet uh, from a habitable structure, and that only makes good sense So, if, if, uh, for fire purposes and, and safety purposes. So, uh, council members, those are the four areas of amendment. Uh, those are the same four areas of amendment that were proposed back in February and after public hearing and comment and further uh, discussion. Uh, we feel that that would be appropriate uh, to enhance this portion of Chapter 18, and I believe that this is uh, a public hearing. So I will take my leave at this time for public comment and then return for any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. So is there anyone that wants to speak against any of the proposed amendments? Okay, is there anyone that would like to speak for the proposed amendments? Questions, comments, considerations for Mr. Davis? Who came up with that, the 10 feet figure? That, I believe, uh, that may be a Mike Brown thing uh, with, with the <laughs> fire department. And off the top of my head, I apologize. That may, I, I, and I don't want to say for certain that that was taken from uh, some, some greater code provisions um, or recommendations on fire safety in general. Uh, but that was a recommendation out of the fire department. Thank you. Good question. I just have one comment. Yes, um, sir. The only concern uh, issue I would have, I like food trucks, but for a vendor, food vendor, to arrive at a parking city parking spot right next to the convention visitor bureau at 6:30. And, you know, they're not ready to serve food at that time, but they're just there to hold that spot until, you know, they get ready to serve. It's a spot also for where the bus parks, you know, visiting bus. I mean, do we, we don't have a schedule of when buses are going to be there. So that is one spot that I would like to see all, you know, no, no food vendors. Yes, sir. Council Member, I might mention that that has been resolved, uh, that uh, your CDB director bought rage cones, is that what they were called? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but those areas are blocked off if we're having buses, and uh, since we've done that, there hasn't been an issue. Okay, as your city attorney, I would not refer to them as rage cones, but friendly <laughs> reminders to the general public. Uh, but hopefully that's uh, how it remedy. It depends on how we understand uh, it. Yes, <laughs> so. yes. And, and there are, uh, it, it's not addressed um, in this, uh, this amendment, but generally in the ordinance with regard, or in the code, I should say, with regard to uh, the number of spots in the areas. And, and then after that, we fall back on our general uh, parking provisions within our code of ordinances. Yeah, I just thought it would have been where the city manager has, you know, he could regulate the hours, but it didn't say location, so. And, and like on, uh, he it was regulate the hours. Does he regulate 
regulate the locations too? Well, there's certain with, within our ordinance. There's certain, uh, and I'll just matter of fact, I'll read it right here in front of me. I'll just go ahead and read it so I don't misquote it. Mobile food unit zoning and location. Mobile food units inside the city limits shall only be stored and operated in area zone M medical B2 general business B3 central business L1 light industrial or L2 uh, heavy industrial unless operated with his uh, city property permit. So uh, we have regulation and, and one of the amendments addresses on city owned properties. Um, I think we, we talked about in public parking spaces except B3 central business, you can't take more than three parking spaces. So that addresses some of that general parking that you mentioned um, earlier. And so um, there are there are some limitations as to where their, their location of operation can be. Thank you. Yes, sir. You know off the top of your head, the 18-59 <coughs> mobile food, food, food units, mm -hmm. including snow cone vendors, shall not conduct sales at a stationary location. The definition of stationary is that greater than 24 hours or 18 hours, or do you remember where we landed there, on that? There, there's a, that, that's a very good question. So if we follow through with that, and, and I don't know if you have that in front of you, uh, Council Member Hens, but that's a good one. So uh, mobile food units, including snow cone vendors, shall not and there is a def definition of mobile food units um, at the beginning of this uh, ordinance section uh, code section shall not conduct sales at a stationary location more than five consecutive days at a location more than 16 hours per location per day then we get into the parking space regulation then it addresses city-owned properties and then within 500 feet of a b3 central business district during events permitted throughout the city Perfect. Thank you. Yes, sir. And that's only on city property, right? Um, well, it can't some his ability. Well, there's, <laughs> there's a difference there. So mm -hmm. if we want to talk about back where we were talking about the city manager with regard mm -hmm. to the, the operation and hours and setting those, that's on city property. Uh, what I just uh, referred to, that was general. general. Yes, okay. sir. Thank you very much. Okay, so if, if there is uh, no further discussion, then uh, Chair would entertain a motion for approval of these uh, changes to the ordinance. Well, I make a motion to approve the ordinance amend in Chapter 18, and it gives business Article 3 as presented. <laughs> as presented. <laughs> I'll second. Okay, moved and seconded that we approve agenda item number eight as presented. If no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. Agenda item number nine considers <coughs> approval of Chapter 380 agreement between the City of Nacogdoches and Dr. Mark Klein for extension of water and sanitary sewer lines at 3900 Northeast Stallings Drive. Philpott, good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council Larissa Philpott, Economic Development Director. I'm here today to present a utility extension agreement. Um, we are using a Chapter 380 agreement to um, accomplish this tonight, or proposing a Chapter 380 agreement. Dr. Mark Klein is proposing to build a two-story, 38,000 square foot medical office building. Um, there's a beautiful rendering of that building provided by um, Army Curtis for us here tonight. It is at least a $5 million construction project. Um, the building will eventually house more than 40 employees and have more than a $4 million annual payroll. Um, there will be a, a, a medical um, use on both stories of this office building. In order to fully service the building, utility extensions are required. Um, if they are extended from areas nearby, then rather than underneath the road, then um, the other properties nearby this, we would accomplish two things. We would service not only this proposed development, but also allow for future development of possibly additional retail or office facilities in the future. So tonight we are asking you um, for a utility extension in the amount of approximately $228,000 to extend both the water and sewer lines to this property. It is a more efficient 
extension then continued bores under the road to service each one of these properties in the future so we're kind of asking you tonight to think ahead a little bit um, and plan ahead a little bit if you've ever been involved in a construction project or looked for new property you know it's a lot a lot more um, it's a lot easier to get a property developed if the utility is already there. It's a lot easier to market a property if the utility is already there. So that is what we're asking you to review tonight. Mr. Ed Klein, or I'm sorry, Mr. Ed Poole is here tonight. <laughs> Wrong Ed <laughs> is here tonight on behalf of Dr. Klein. Should you have any questions about the development itself? And with that, I will step to the side. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone here that would like to speak to this? Um, do you think there's anything that you would like to add? Mayor Brophy, Council Members, I'm Ed Poole with Charles Poole Real Estate representing Dr. Klein. Um, there are a lot of dynamics here. <laughs> Um, there are no utilities in that area, and this is a major retail growth area for us. Uh, matter of fact, Shive North Street, which is almost built up, this is our next corridor. Uh, with not having utilities in place, uh, it's going to be difficult to develop, and this will affect property all the way to University Drive. So <clears throat> it's needed. Um, it's, it's preemptive, and, and I think it's something that um, uh, is, is very wise of the city to pursue. Um, there are discussions of other developments in that area, and this will assist, assist that as well. And the last piece of the puzzle that, that um, Larissa uh, alluded to is that whenever we have someone new come into the community, we kind of roll out the red carpet, and we give them incentives. We do all kinds of things for new members of the community. Those that develop within our, our community that are existing already and trying to better things that already live here, we don't necessarily do that. And this is uh, an opportunity for us to, to begin that process a, a little bit and, and assist in things that the city can assist in. So anyway, I, I'm very positive about it. It's going to be a beautiful development. Uh, if all works well, this will be just part of the development. And so um, we'll have a lot of, a lot of things. Uh, Larissa has numbers about employment and salaries and all that sort of thing uh, because the second floor is, will be all rental space and those will be physicians' offices as well. So anyway, very positive for the city. Any questions while I'm here? Thank okay. you Thank very you. much. Appreciate it. Okay, questions or comments for Ms. Hill? Yeah. Okay, having none, I think that's great. Thank you very much. Okay, Chair will entertain a motion for approval. I'll make a motion we approve the Chapter 80 agreement between the City of Nacogdoches and Dr. Mark Klein for an extension of water and sanitary lines at 3900 Northeast Stallings Drive. Second. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. If no further discussion, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? <coughs> That's great. Motion passes. Number 10, fire and emergency planning update. Good evening. Mayor Brophy, members of council, uh, my name is Michael Self, a captain with the fire department. I will do my best to keep it under the 30 minutes that Chief Kiplinger told me to talk. Uh, I will try to be brief and speak to our fire prevention efforts. Um, we have a mission statement that we use at the fire department in the slide presentation that you have, and it is based, our fire prevention is based off of four major goals, which is to reduce the frequency, to reduce severity, to reduce injury, and to enhance firefighter safety. Um, the guys that work for the Nacogdoches Fire Department enjoy the job that they do. And in a weird way, they enjoy fighting fire, which some folks do not understand. But I believe I speak for each member of our department. We would be happy if we never went to another one. Uh, we do not enjoy seeing people injured. We do not enjoy seeing their belongings destroyed. And so we have a very comprehensive program of trying to prevent fires. Um, what we do and it's built off of public education that is the foundation that we build our program off of <clears throat> and it is, includes planning on behalf of our guys training which i'll speak to in just a moment an inspections program and also the investigation efforts of our fire marshal's office um, in public education i just kind of outline a lot of the things that we do uh, the guys are currently gearing up for our october program 
Uh, in October, we go to every public and private school here inside the city of Nacogdoches and are requested of some county schools to come and give our program to them also. Um, we have, we'd speak to roughly 2,500 students per year. We cover all students in pre-K through second grade here in town. And then there's other engagements that we go to, special things that we're requested to go and give fire safety presentations to them. Uh, we do this by having a special team of speakers that really enjoy working with kids. They really do a great job speaking. And so we send this public education team to all the schools along with a fire engine. And once the students have their presentation, uh, they, their prize is to get to go outside and see a fire truck. And usually if they see the fire truck before the presentation, the guys have lost them before they begin. Um, some of the things in which we speak about is we teach them about smoke detectors, um, calling 911, get out, stay out, and stop, drop, and roll. Uh, one quick story that took place this last year, we always tell the kids around the time change to remind their parents to change all the batteries in their smoke detectors. And one of the firemen called me, and he said he had a four-year-old in a school here, he said, you owe me $20. He said, my son came home, and we had to go to Lowe's and buy batteries. He said, and $20 worth of batteries later, we've changed every battery in our house. <laughs> so the kids are listening and are getting what we're teaching to them. Uh, we also do this through adult education. Uh, we gladly spend, send speakers to organizational meetings like Lions, Rotary, uh, the newcomers organization, and we will go and teach them fire safety, more geared for adults, as far as to in their homes and such. Uh, we also go to church groups upon request, and we've begun a program in the last couple of years. We have a new firefighter that's completing his second year who is very fluent in Spanish and has a passion for reaching the Hispanic community here in town and has begun going to groups and uh, speaking to them and also providing literature in Spanish to them. And so we have a lot of education material on all different subjects that we're able to provide to the public upon request. Some of the special programs that we do, uh, the first one listed there is the fifth grade reading program. Uh, this last spring we completed our seventh year of our fifth grade reading program and what we do, we go to all the local schools and over a six week time period we have the teachers and the administrators look for the most improved reader at that school over that six weeks time period. Uh, in the public schools what we encourage them to do is to use it as an encouragement program that is shrouded by a reading program, to look for students who are struggling. It's not who scores the highest, it's not who reads the most, it's maybe a child that's been bullied, a parent who's going through struggles at home who just needs that boost. And at the end of that six weeks, we go back, uh, we give prize bags of school supplies and books for them to read, but their biggest prize is we go to their house one morning with a fire engine and we give them breakfast in the fire engine and, and carry them to the front door of their school. And so uh, we partnered this year, the uh, Retired Teachers Association of Nacogdoches, and I believe it was the Rotary Club, uh, gave donations this year to fund that program for the fire department. Um, also, we do a smoke detector and battery installation program. We've partnered in the past with the American Red Cross on that. And what we do, anyone can call in a citizen that is in need, and we will go and install smoke detectors in their homes. Um, all of our fire engines carry a couple of smoke detectors on them. If our guys go to a medical call, and while they're in the home, they notice that there's no detectors in the home, they will ask the folks, would they like for them to install some before they leave? Um, we do a lot of battery installations for the elderly here in Nacogdoches because we would rather respond and do that for them as a public service rather than them trying to climb up and do it themselves and then become injured. And then also we do foster home inspections for city residents. Um, rather than them having to wait on the state fire marshal's office to come and inspect, uh, we assign that to our inspectors and we use the state's form and we'll go in to further the calls for that. Then also at festivals, we usually set up a booth where we provide first aid and also educational materials uh, to anyone that would like. Um, the inspection and planning piece for the guys comes with in commercial inspections and currently this year we've performed over 1,200 um, pre-plans, as we call them, and commercial inspections. Um, before the meeting, I left a brochure, which is kind of a quick explanation of what we look for when we do fire safety inspections. 
Uh, the pre-plan is for the guys to go into businesses to know where utilities are located, exits are located in a safe environment. That way, if they ever have to respond in an emergency scene with smoke in the building and fire, they're familiar with the building ahead of time. Um, part of that planning is to also just ha get a mindset of where the nearest hydrant is and all the different things surrounding that business to where if they do respond, they know ahead of time and our response is faster and we, we're better able to get in and extinguish the fire. Uh, also, we use that as training for our guys ahead of time. And then while we're there, we do it at the same time. We do the pre-plans at the same time as our inspections. So we don't bother local businesses. We go in one time and do that as one. And the main things they look for on the life safety inspection is looking at the exits to make sure they're clear, uh, fire safety items like extinguishers, fire alarm systems, sprinkler systems. A look at a general look at the electrical systems, make sure they're not overwhelming their electrical system with uh, extension cords and such. And just look generally around the building at the fire department access that we would have. Um, a lot of this is partnered with our engineering department and the, the GIS guys where this, a lot of this information is saved electronically on our iPads. Um, responding to an incident, our guys can with just a couple of clicks on the app, have all the information that they need ahead of time before they get there with the nearest hydrant locations. Uh, if there's something that they found that's a hazard in the building that they're not used to, they know that ahead of time coming across town to the fire and it uh, helps our guys out. Um, any questions? No questions, but a comment, and a comment about foster homes. Uh, Nacogdoches City and Nacogdoches County has, uh, they are really short on foster homes, and some of the time it is due for the state to come and inspect and et cetera. Really appreciative of the fire department, local fire department, to speed up that process. Thank it's you. really been helpful. Um, well, no, I was going to see if there was any public comment first, and then we'll see if we have any other questions for you, so sure. don't go anywhere. Is there anyone that has a comment they'd like to make about this presentation? I think okay. we can add to it. I think we can add mold. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, and I also wanted to thank you for the work that you did. One of my first jobs when I came to join my dad's law practice was to make sure the building was up to code for some reason. And you came and checked out our fire extinguisher, and it was, like, embarrassingly, like, 20 years old or something <laughs> like that. So thank you. No problem. I am um, interested um, in the work that you guys are doing with the Spanish-speaking families, um, more so in terms of, of outreach and response. And I was wondering if you had um, any details about what groups he's going to and, 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 and the response that you're getting. The original outreach that the firefighter performed was going to a lot of the predominantly Hispanic stores, grocery stores, and talking to them and leaving brochures there at the counter. Um, our concern is the children in the schools are educated. I mean, from pre-K up, they hear it every year. We try to change up our program to where they get a little something different. We have so many immigrants coming in that have never been taught fire safety. And so there's that gap. So we want to reach the adults to where when the kids come home, they understand what their kids are saying. And so he's also reached out to some church groups and offered to come and speak and to predominantly Hispanic organizations. He's made that offer to them. Um, I know one time I, we went to a, Fredonia Hill Baptist Church had a English as a second language class, and they allowed us to come in and to present fire safety to them. So, thank you. I, I really appreciate the the pre like <laughs> like her. Yeah, we had a an old fire extinguisher, <laughs> but that was resolved. But I appreciate the uh, the pre emergency plans. That is brilliant because mm -hmm. we've. Frankenstein, one of our buildings, and I, you know, there's no blueprints on file that would ever be able to tell somebody where to go if there was an emergency. So, your your guys did an amazing job. Take they took notes on where to go, where where the access uh, access points were, and that I can only imagine how helpful that would be. So, way to go on that. That's great. Great. Thank you very Thank much. You. Appreciate it.
Agenda item number 11, consider draft <laughs> fiscal year 2020 Convention and Visitors Bureau marketing plan. Ms. Morgan, good evening. Good evening. Um, when I was here previously and spoke about the budget, I think we mentioned that our marketing plan for this year was going to stay pretty much the same, and that's true to form. We've got a few tweaks that we will go over, though. So if you have any questions along the way. Um, I always like to start the new fiscal year off with a focus word. It seems very new age, but it works. Um, so our focus word for this upcoming fiscal year is providence to use foresight and be uh, prudent in our management of the resources that we have. This is hopefully going to be a financially building year for us where we really look at our expenditures and return on investment, but never sacrificing quality or the brand of Nacogdoches. Our mission and purpose statement have remained the same. We're going to continue with our positioning statement um, of historic, beautiful, charming. We've added inclusive um, to make sure that we are uh, targeting all groups that would have an interest in visiting us and making sure that they would feel as welcomed as they truly are. Our initiative targets are the modern family, and that looks like a multi-generational traveler as well as heritage tourist, um, which is the past as the present with the local history, uh, planners, event planners, um, looking at our residents as hometown hosts, using them as ambassadors to help us, help the staff represent the entirety of the city and all of its many, its diverse assets. And then obviously the great outdoors, which is probably our most prized asset that we have here. The different tourism that we're focusing on is primarily leisure tourism. It's our bread and butter, uh, meetings and events, still really trying to build up sports tourism, staff believes firmly that this is a possibility for us but that is just one of those things that you have to have the infrastructure behind it to uh, support it and uh, we are doing as much of the preliminary work as we can while we wait for that infrastructure to come so we're not uh, we're not being docile about it we're doing as much as we can where we are to be prepared when we can uh, build up that infrastructure and start marketing and then using our local market, being a resource and a contributing community partner to the community of Nacogdoches. Our goal is always to convert our marketing and media efforts into sales in these four categories. Moving the needle, this is always just a fun fact. Um, in 2018, travel and tourism accounted for the addition of 2.8 million in local tax receipts in Nacogdoches County, and that comes out of the uh, governor's office. Uh, it was an increase of 6.6% over last year, with total direct traveler spending exceeding $85 million, which was an increase of 7.3%. And this was for Nacogdoches County. Um, and with thoughtful and prescribed marketing and messaging efforts, we can reasonably maximize that growth. But for the last five to seven years, we've seen incremental growth in that, so that's good. As important as the numbers are, the other focus for staff is to remember that every number has a name, every name has a story, and every story matters. And that is true for everybody that walks across the threshold of the visitor center as well as every story of Nacogdoches that we preserve and we continue to tell. So people first, we want to continue to develop meaningful personalized connections, create more <coughs> personalized, more emotional connections with all of our customers and influencers to drive our brand awareness and visitation. Being very story forward in all of our approaches, focus on destination storytelling, reinforce the history of Nacogdoches while making these stories relevant for today's diverse tour space, as well as continuously increasing our brand awareness. Our KPIs, our performance indicators, we're going to look at our unique web visits to gauge our success, visitor information request and number, visitor center counts, social media fans, reach, engagement, the number of tours and events that come through, uh, our lodging occupancy numbers, uh, responses to our calls to action and our marketing efforts, and as always, our visitor input and response. This is our future map just to show that uh, this is how staff has come together to really think through uh, what our strengths are, where our weaknesses are, any opportunities that we have. Um, that's. This is our lodging performance for this uh, past fiscal year to date. 
occupancy is in blue. And the red is REVPAR, which is revenue per available room. And ADR is the green, and that's average daily rate. So ADR, these are doing exactly what we would want them to do. Average daily rate, we want to see that be as consistent as possible. And uh, occupancy, of course, we, we like to see a lot of that. We like to see the blue go really, really high. In comparison to last year, year to date, we are about 2% um, above our occupancy for last year. And you can see our running 12, we are just neck and neck there. One of the things that we're having to focus on as we move into the next fiscal year is uh, different sources of revenue, and one of those is the collection of hotel occupancy tax in our short-term short, short rentals, such as Airbnbs and VRBO and HomeAway. Currently, as of uh, about two hours ago, we have 66 active short-term rentals in the Nacogdoches area. Um, not all of those have been registered with the finance department <laughs> and are remitting the taxes as we'd like them to. We are currently, staff is currently researching joining 12 other cities in Texas that are reach, entering into private agreements with these host sites such as Airbnb so that they would, similarly with their arrangements to the state, um, they would collect our local taxes for us as well. And there's been some great success. So uh, we're researching that to see if that's viable for us. But you can see just in the time that they've been, that this specific, this is AirDNA that collects this data for us. Uh, but you can see the tremendous growth in, um, in these types of properties in our lodging landscape and it's not going to go away this is just the future of tourism so we need to find some way in our system to level the playing field for all of our lodging partners so that everybody is playing by the same rules when it comes to remitting taxes um, and also this is revenue that will always go back to marketing so it's money that we can reinvest in ourselves <clears throat> Our advertising and marketing, we're going to stick with our campaign. It's been very successful for us and a state award winner. No big will. Um, but we have a knack for that. And um, as such, that will cut our marketing cost. This is just an example of how that ad translates into our print media. Very classically designed by Hancock. Staff identified the five main pillars to focus our advertising around history, nature, arts and culture, antiques and unique retail, and then meeting conference space and opportunities. For this year, we're still maintaining those because they still have proven, they've tracked, to still be accurate and current and relevant. But we're also going to look at some subsets out of those categories to focus some more of our marketing on just so that our message doesn't get stale. Our primary presence will always be, continue to be in Texas Monthly, Texas Highways, Sawdust to support the partnership with Stephen F. Austin and County Line, which helps us um, get our message out in the region. Where appropriate, we're going to utilize local print publications, but it's important that people realize that our goal, our primary mission, is to get the word out outside of a 50 mile radius. So, um, as much as we would love to support uh, and advertise in local publications, that doesn't really play to our mission. So we always have to um, look at the return on what we could possibly get out of the placement of our advertising. And one change that uh, the CVB board has directed staff is to, as the budget allows, to explore different uh, marketing, types of marketing such as outdoor advertising, streaming advertising such as on uh, Pandora or Hulu and also um, gas station TV. So when you're gassing up your car and some nice person starts talking to you, they tell you about Nacogdoches and how we have a knack for stuff like that. To market for group sales, staff identified print publications and digital media specific to our niche market. That's lots of fancy words just to say that we're really targeting groups that are naturally attracted to our area, such as car collectors, motorcycle enthusiasts. Um, those are just natural organic fits for us, so we're really trying to uh, complete and solidify those relationships. 
Mike Bay continues as our coordinator of visitor services. Um, we are increasing the products that we sell in our, um, in our gift shop area, always looking at ways to elevate the visitor experience. We are just in the beginning stages of our volunteer recruitment program, aptly called Be Like Mike, and we have had great success in getting more volunteers during the week as well as on weekends to come in and start volunteering at the visitor center and hang out with Mike. And um, he oversees the office and the building management. Our focus for visitor services for fiscal year 2020 is on increasing the quality and the diversity of our products, continue with that ambassador training and expand it where possible and elevate the visitor experience. And as always, explore alternative income, income sources such as online sales. And that is our current board. <coughs> and hopefully your staff. Okay, well thank you very much. Um, is there uh, anyone that would like to comment on this presentation? Council, any questions or comments for Ms. Morgan? Uh, how are we doing with the sports uh, well, again, venues? I mean, we haven't. We have the venues to attract more. We have venues. I think the problem is, is the that whole industry. They have built up the standards of what they require to be viable hosts. So mm -hmm. it's not enough to have lighted softball fields. You have to have lighted softball fields with a minimum of nine available fields so yeah, that right. more people can play. So, um, I mean, we, we've got quality structures. It's more just a size right. of it. So it's, I think it's a win, not an if we get there. But again, we just have to focus our efforts on building those relationships and finding out, just use this time while we wait for our infrastructure to catch up with us. I, you know, to, to do the research and do everything that we can while we wait for the rest of that. It's, it's a chicken and an egg sort of thing, but I think we, one day we will be there. And I know Brian Bray is, is on track with that, so we're keeping those relationships between Parks and Recreation and the CBB strong and open so that any opportunity that we can take together, um, you know, we're stronger if we, if we approach that together. I agree with what you just said. Thank you. You're welcome. And I would like to say, I'm sorry, I failed to mention it. Um, the CVB board has not approved this marketing plan. We did have an informal discussion where they gave directives. So if there is anything that uh, council would like to see changed, I can take that back for the final appro approval. Uh, CVB board has had to rearrange its meetings to accommodate our new members. So those are now going to be on the third Friday of every month, and our next meeting will be on September the 20th, and that's when the CVB board will approve our marketing plan. Um, I remember, I think it was in a meeting in May that uh, you showed us a video that was very, very well done, but there was a concern for diversity, and so I appreciate um, you addressing that with the adding the inclusivity mm -hmm. part. Um, I am interested to hear about specific examples of, of, of what that looks like. Okay, um, it's a good question. I think <clears throat> there are small things that we can do so we can make sure that the information and the collateral, the brochures that we have, that they're easily translatable on the, on the internet into whatever language we need. And we do get a fair amount, like 13% of our visitor traffic is international. We just had somebody in the visitor center today from New Zealand, um, but we have Finnish people in, we have a lot of Hispanic people in. Um, so there is a need for that. We don't have the budget to have printed publications like that, so we do have to rely on electronic and digital. We want to be very careful in our marketing efforts so that our message is always authentic while still being inclusive. Um, and genuine, and we never want to present a picture of something to the outside world that we can't duplicate on any given day that they come back. So um, I, I think to answer your question best, it's a mindset that we need to be looking at um, access for differently abled people. We need to look at certainly race and religion and ages and interest of that. So it really is just 
a spirit of inclusivity in everything we do because even in the making of that video, there were no paid actors. Uh, there was no staged events. Those were natural, organic things that were captured by the videographer. <clears throat> so it never occurred to us for a moment that there would be a group that wasn't welcomed <laughs> because we really, we really do accept everybody here. But, but the criticism was received and noted and obviously has made an appearance in our marketing plan said so that it's always in the forefront of, in our mind because even though we make the assumption that everybody is welcomed, we need to go the extra step to make sure that we communicate that not only in our words but in our actions. Thank you. You're welcome. Sure, you do an amazing job. It is really hard to validate the return on investment in any way on marketing like this, and you do a fantastic job on that. So I just want to honor you for that. I thank you very that. much. I appreciate that. Okay. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Very much. Great presentation. Thanks. Agenda item number 12, receive Nacogdoches Economic Development Corporation's annual report. Hello, Ms. Hello again. Hello, hello. Tonight I am going over what we have done in the last year um, and giving you just a little bit of a snapshot of what we plan to do over the next year. Um, thank you very much for approving the contract during the consent agenda earlier. Now we, we can get to work, right? Um, in this last year, we have worked hard on developing our East Texas Manufacturing Alliance, which is a joint group between Nacogdoches and Angelina counties, getting our manufacturers to work together. Um, one recent development out of that that we are working on this next week is a manufacturing day where our manufacturers in both counties will come to schools in both counties. So maybe we might have Lockheed Martin from Lufkin come here and might have Mass Motorsports go to Angelina County to talk to School kids, we're hoping to reach ninth graders um, about what manufacturing jobs look like to get them excited about manufacturing. I think if you ask your average eighth grader what is, or ninth grader what does manufacturing look like, they'd probably give you a very different answer than the cool stuff that goes on at Mass Motorsports. So we're trying to get them excited about that and maybe give them a little bit of a, a plan for the future at the same time. We completed the fourth year of our Kiwi Grant, which is an important partnership with SFA, which also um, supports our agricultural community. I-69 advocacy and planning is always very, very important to us. Um, Jim Jeffers has laid a great foundation for Nacogdoches as far as receiving I-69 funding. Um, we are funding, we, the state, is, is funding those projects one step at a time, one project at a time, rather than funding the entire portion through the state at once. So it's important that we get out there and advocate for our community. As far as small business development workshops and classes go, I know you are familiar with those, but I did want to mention that this year we have branched out and not just held our business academy, but we have more regular, shorter events in conjunction with the Chamber of Commerce, um, another important partner for us. We are blessed at NEDCO to have a, a partnership of over 60 local businesses and entities such as the city. The chamber has several hundred members. Um, I think I would be lying if I guessed, but probably well over 700 members. So we use them as a partner to reach our smallest businesses in the community. Also, we worked on developing a stronger internship program with SFA. SFA is, is a great asset to our community, and also the students that go to SFA are an asset for our businesses, and vice versa. Those businesses are an asset to our students, and so we've worked on making some guides that make it a little less scary to hire an intern, um, which is funny. It's what, what everybody said when we asked, why don't you have interns? They said, do we treat them like employees? How do we talk to them? How do we get to them? And so we've worked on breaking down those barriers and making that process easier. On a daily basis, um, for your investment of $245,000 a year, so you that is $95,000 in, in a cash investment, that Ron Collins spoke to earlier today, um, $13,000 in an in-kind investment to allow us to office here at City Hall, which is incredibly useful to be able to be down the hall from, from Steve Bartlett and, and Jim Jeffers, um, and also $150,000 in a savings account, essentially, for economic development. For that, you get the additional support of over $200,000 from your partners in business in the community. 
And that on a daily basis means that I get to support our businesses. I get to have personal conversations in helping businesses expand. Um, I, I get to help them walk through development, which I think is something that we have really stepped up in the last couple of years is we pride ourselves on being a development friendly community, but to have an office inside City Hall that can say, here is how we're gonna do this step by step. Here is how to walk through your construction process. Um, that's vital. We have about 1,700 touches with businesses every year. Um, I know we're, we're trying hard to, to measure our impact and measure um, how, many, how many contacts we have, and, and that is one of the ones that I was able to pull out this year. So that's a little over seven businesses a day that, that we're reaching out to. One of our bigger events this year, and this was new, was the Governor Small Business Forum that we hosted just a couple of weeks ago. This was the Governor Small Business Forum for our entire region. We had well over 200 attendees, which sounds fantastic. And then um, to hear that Houston had a similar forum and they also had well over 200 attendees, I think sounds really good that we had that many folks that attended. We're hoping to possibly repeat that again in the future. Our, one of our major announcements that we are very proud of this year is the attraction of a new manufacturer. Um, we have not gotten to announce that sort of thing in a long time. This is um, Solero Energy, which is starting right now with just a small workforce, but hopefully in the, in the very near future we'll have 100 employees with the possibility of expanding to many more, in, many more than that as they expand their lines. I always go over these, these indicators, economic indicators, but I will just tell you tonight that they are doing well. Um, our median household income is increasing. It's not quite where we want it yet. We want to be above the state average, but we're working on that. Um, trying to compete with the West Texas oil field makes that a little difficult, but that is why industrial attraction is so important to us, so we can continue to attract high-wage jobs. Our unemployment rate continues to be very low. Um, our goal is to be below the state average. That's asking for quite a lot in a, in a time when we're at 3.7%, um, but we'll, we'll keep working on that. Our poverty level still needs some, we do need stronger work here. Um, this is again why we're industrial attraction and workforce development is so important to us. We are still lagging behind the rest of the state. Sales tax for the year is um, relatively flat. It's gone up just a small amount. Um, part of that, I believe, is uncertainty in the economy. Um, it's been a little unpredictable in how to um, determine what one month is going to look from month to month. Um, but as far as from 2015, when this goal was first set, we're up 11% from 2015. So our major tasks coming up in the next fiscal year have not changed wildly from what they've been in the future, but just a little bit more specific. Our industrial attraction plan. Um, this is to look at what we have done in the past, um, look at the major industries that we have targeted and determine why we haven't had the best success in, in attracting those, um, what are our gaps, and also maybe review those industries and see if there are other industries that maybe make more sense, something that we're better suited for that we haven't, haven't made a concerted effort towards before. Also, teleworker and retiree rec recruitment. In my mind, those two go hand in hand. These are folks that can live can choose where they want to live and work anywhere or not work <laughs> anywhere. And we are working on that in conjunction with the CBB. A robust business retention and expansion plan, as I said earlier, we've got about 1,700 business touches a year and we're hoping to increase that number more formally and also um, do some data mining when we do those visits. Retail and entertainment redevelopment and expansion, um, you heard from Ed Poole here tonight, our biggest hurdle there is getting properties available for redevelopment. We've got people interested, we just have to find the sites for them. Collaboration with SFA is always on our list. I'm very excited um, to hear of Dr. Scott Gordon's plans for SFA. If you were able to hear him speak at the Chamber of Commerce luncheon just a few weeks ago, he spoke a lot about things that would affect economic development and fit quite nicely in with a lot of our plans for the future. 
advocacy for I-69 will continue. We should have a groundbreaking here in October for the South Street flyover. Um, and then our next big hurdle is to obtain funding for the 59-259 intersection. <coughs> it is in the state's next unified transportation plan to study the, the project. And so next is, is to try to get the money to actually build it. We are currently working on um, seven projects that we are, are actively pushing and working. Um, over the last year, we had about 12 projects from the state that unfortunately we didn't qualify for. Um, one we did and were able to submit and weren't selected for. I know in the past we've you've asked for, for numbers similar to that as, as far as activity goes. Um, there are a number of projects that we work on throughout the year, and, and I think Chief C.V. Will, will agree with me here. When you have a case that you can't solve, it's a cold case until it's finally solved. Um, and so I can say there's only one project that I know actively chose to move to another city, and that one actually moved out of state. And so I feel like we are, as Ron Collins said earlier, um, we ha we're on the cusp. We have a lot of exciting things moving, um, thanks to our partners and thanks to the city council support. That I will step aside. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone here that has uh, wants to make a comment about this presentation? No. Okay. Council questions or comments from Ms. Philpott? Uh, just like Councilmember Hens told Sherry, um, I would like to echo the same about you. I think that you do a really great job, and it's a really hard job that you do, so I appreciate it. Thank you. I do appreciate you taking taking time and making an effort to distill down into KPIs something that's trackable, because I think for your average citizen that pays taxes mm -hmm. and they hear how much money goes into the, the, net, the EDC group, I'll stop saying that, <laughs> the EDC group, they wonder what are we getting for our money and so I think I, I, I know personally you do a lot but I think it's really good for us to be able to push that out there 1700 contacts and just touching on a lot of the things that you are doing beyond just uh, casting a vision and like building up uh, things that a lot of your average taxpayer can't relate to so you're doing a great job there I thank appreciate you. that okay. great thank you very much thank you uh, agenda item 13, consider ordinance amending chapter 82 solid waste, portions of chapter 82 solid waste. Uh, and Mr. Davis again. Thank you, Mayor Brophy, council members. Uh, the agenda item for you at this time addresses recycling or the furtherance, hopefully, of recycling <laughs> efforts in, in our city. Still laboring under the instruction of Mr. Jeffers to be brief, I will endeavor to do so <laughs> as the hour is growing late. Um, very briefly, just a, a, a brief history of, of where we've been, kind of our path to where we are. Um, up till about the summer of 2009, we had a curbside recycling program. And, and due to the cost and some participation factors, uh, that program was uh, discontinued. However, we did continue to encourage folks uh, to take their recyclable items to drop sites. Um, uh, you know, I think we heard last week from Steve Chisholm and his bottle ears, you know, that they, they do a fantastic job and we really appreciate their efforts. Um, but even with these locations, with things such as plastics and, and certain papers, uh, because of uh, the demand really worldwide of those types of recyclables and the drop off of that, it's just created a situation environment where it's really not viable uh, to transport that at this time for the city. Uh, to to drop off facilities and so with that back um, I guess it was probably in the March spring of this year uh, it was announced that because of these costs uh, that we would begin to place those into the landfill as opposed to transport those to uh, recycling centers um, and that brings us to where we are today uh, just this last month August of 2019 we were approached by a commercial recyclable waste company or uh, several individuals who are interested in a startup of that type uh, the Dotsons who are actually I believe here today waving their hands um, as, as I speak about the possibilities of doing um, a certain uh, recyclable private um, hauler uh, service in review of our ordinance of our code, if we take a look under Chapter 82 that addresses solid waste, 
um, it sets out, and I think in good form, um, how we go about collecting trash, garbage, refuse, solid waste, um, and those responsibilities follow the city as, as they should. And we, I, would, I would say this, that uh, with our landfill under the, 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 the good stewardship of Steve Bartlett and Kerry Walker and his folks, they do a fantastic job uh, with that facility, and it is a real asset uh, for the city and for our citizens uh, and will be for many years to come. I think the more I learn about it, the more I think there are a lot of cities that would be envious of, of where we find ourselves in that situation. Uh, we are the sole collector um, of garbage, uh, of, of solid waste in the city, and there's really no path uh, for somebody to come in, even on a limited basis, uh, to do recycling. And so that began a, a somewhat feverish effort uh, to do an analyzation of, of what we have code-wise and where we might go and, and, and how we might proceed in a fashion that would um, allow uh, for such a service but at the same time uh, protect the, the health, safety, and welfare of our citizens as well as is our abilities to collect solid waste in general. So that's where we find ourselves tonight. Um, and I will not endeavor to read every bit of this, or I would indeed put everybody to sleep, but there's several provisions in our existing portion of Chapter 82 that needed uh, small tweaking, actually two sections, um, and those very largely are, are small amendments which would allow for the bigger amendment, which comes in the form of actually the creation of a new Article 4 entitled Permitting of Commercial Recyclable Waste Haulers. Um, and uh, at this time, uh, we do not have such an article. We do not have such provisions uh, within our code. Um, I'll go through those sections uh, briefly and certainly after public comment. If there's, if there's questions, we can go deeper into those various sections. But to begin with, we set out a purpose. Why are we doing this? Well, uh, we, we're allowing this path for, for limited commercial recyclable waste collection. Um, and so we're, we're really, it's, it's an effort for promotion of recycling within our city. So that's what we're doing. That's what we set forth in the, uh, that section for our purposes. On definitions, we've got everything from what is a commercial recyclable waste hauler to what is a permit to what is recyclable waste, which means, and everybody's going to cringe when I say this, non-putressible solid waste. I just like to say the word non-putressible. Um, so what does that mean that it doesn't become putrid? Um, and so non-putressible, and we set that out. Um, all kidding aside, you know, it would, this, this does limit to recyclables. What does that mean? We're talking about glass, aluminum, cardboard, uh, cans of certain types, plastics, paper, uh, things like that that are void of liquid or few, uh, food, these, these uh, putressible uh, attachments that we have normally with waste. Um, with regard to uh, the scope, um, again, this is to, to allow for recyclable uh, waste haulers, uh, but it also protects the city's ability if at some point, if it's the council's determination, um, whether it becomes more economically viable or there's another path that becomes available this does not preclude, I think it's very important, uh, this does not preclude the city from, from engaging in recycling efforts uh, at this time or going forward. And I do think that that's uh, important also. We wanted to make sure that, that there was no confusion. So, Council Member Hens, if, if, you're, if you want to recycle uh, whatever it might be and you want to transfer it to, to wherever um, or Councilmember Fisher, if you want to take something to Steve and, and his bottle ears, an individual or a business that's generating their own recyclables, this is not a problem. You don't have to go get a permit is the bottom line. So we didn't want to thwart those efforts in any, any way. Uh, commercial hauler permit under Section 82-157 that we've created, that's just that. Um, if you're going to if you're going to haul um, recyclable waste and you're going to do it in a commercial fashion, then you've got to have a permit. Um, so how do you go about that? Well, there is an application process, which leads us to the next section. Uh, there are many uh, subparts of that. 
a uh, matter of fact, I think there's 14 in all. Everything from who you are, what the name of your entity is, where are you going to haul it, how are you going to haul it, um, what do you plan to haul, container sizes, um, essentially a, a, like a business plan. Are you, are you viable, going to be able to do this, addresses insurance, uh, fees, all these different things. And so that sets forth a fairly comprehensive application process, how one would go about um, an application if they wish to engage in this business. Uh, the processing of the permit application, won't get into all that, but it does have a, a component of it, again, where um, there can be uh, review, is this the best thing for the city? Is this, you know, do, does this protect health, health safety, welfare? Um, there's, there's a component, uh, does this serve a public convenience or necessity uh, component to look at? Is there a better way possibly for the city to do this or is there something in, in um, communion that would, could be done with this? There's also uh, an inspection component, which I think is important uh, to make sure that uh, a vehicle or a trailer uh, would be roadworthy um, so we don't have um, equipment out on the roads that would not be safe and wouldn't protect uh, the public. Um, there's, uh, in this application process and the, in the processing of it, if somebody's deficient, if they don't have all the things they're supposed to have, then there's, uh, there's the ability for uh, the director to, uh, to inform the individual, the applicant, and they'd have 30 days to try to remedy whatever problem it would be. So there's a, there's a real process uh, set up for that, so we wouldn't be arbitrary in the way we go about it. Insurance, we felt that was important. Um, if folks are going to be out there on the road, then they should be properly insured, so we set limits on that. We also uh, require that it would be, uh, they'd have to have a general liability uh, policy in place. They'd also have to have appropriate uh, business automobile uh, insurance um, as well. What would the permit term be? It'd be 12 months. This would be a renewal situation. So um, one would have to make an application, submit the proper number of box tops. Um, if they receive the permit, then they would have to comply with the requirements and then they would have to uh, seek an, an additional permit. Um, and certainly if they have the application on file, but they would have to up any additional <coughs> information or changes in the way that they go about uh, their business or what they may be doing. Um, the regulation, um, I, I think that the, and I won't go through every bit of this, but I think there are some very Im important parts that, uh, that the, the, the receptacle would have to be, couldn't be out in a street or an alleyway or a highway. They would have to be back off the curb, essentially, uh, with regard to the employees or how they go about their business. So they'd have to do, uh, conduct their business in a way that they're not just throwing trash or, or, or this material on our streets, and if they do so, they have to clean it up. Uh, the containers, there was a lot of talk about containers. You know, do we say, okay, you've got to have a blue plastic bag, or do you have to have a hard plastic container? We left that open. Uh, it would certainly have to be approved uh, by the city, whatever was used, but uh, we left that for some leeway, but it would have to be an appropriate container so we don't have uh, garbage that might be strewn out in the streets or along property. Uh, we did borrow a little bit from uh, TCEQ requirements uh, under the administrative code uh, about what constitutes recyclable materials um, and what would be allowed. It would be unrealistic to say you would have zero percent of your recyclable materials that wouldn't contain something that wouldn't qualify. However, we want to keep that at a very compressed, a very low level uh, because uh, we don't want a situation where somebody would come in and say, well, I'm a commercial uh, recyclable hauler, and then they have some creep on, on regular uh, garbage, um, and that would, that would not fit within the confines of this. So there's a 5% threshold that was taken some from, from some of the TCEQ regs. Um, the, uh, the business operator would have to keep records. We would, they would have to produce such records. Uh, from whatever facility they might take it to to make sure that we don't exceed that over a year period. Uh, and I do think that that's uh, important with regard to uh, recycling centers that they take uh, the, the recyclables to. These have to be properly licensed facilities. So you can't go dump it in the backyard, just can't go dump it out in a pasture. It's got to be a properly permitted and approved by the state or whatever other regulatory body facility. Um, also, uh, we wanted to make sure that we didn't have situations where uh, we had 
um, you know, trash bags or whatever full of these recyclable materials sitting for days on end um, out on the curb. Um, and so with regard to, there's also requirements on, on their, their schedule of, of pickup and the hours of their pickup, but that uh, generally speaking within 24 hours of the placement of the, of the container that the service is going to come by and remove that. Um, oh, there's one last thing before I move on from that section, uh, that they have to uh, make sure that their, their vehicle and or trailer um, are cleaned on a regular basis uh, with the city and talking to Kerry Walker. We clean our garbage trucks out every day, um, and we, we uh, wash them on a, on a very regular basis. So we're asking uh, that uh, the hauler make sure that they maintain their vehicle or trailer in a clean and appropriate fashion. Um, there is a suspension um, or revocation pr proponent uh, uh, portion of this under Section 82-163. Uh, if somebody doesn't follow the requirements, um, if there's various violations, it depends on uh, the severity of it, but there, there can be um, a suspension period of up to 90 days that they'd have to come into compliance. Um, if the violation is severe enough, then they can have their permit completely revoked. Uh, we did uh, provide under this section that there is an appeal process and that would go up through uh, the city manager. Uh, the final section that would be added under this particular article, which would be brand new, would be uh, an actual penalties and remedies situation, so section. So if somebody violated uh, any provision of this code, they'd be subject to uh, prosecution. Every day is a separate violation. Uh, with that, um, this does not preclude us from seeking uh, any and all civil remedies, should those become uh, necessary, whatever form they might take. So with that, I will take my leave, and uh, if anybody has any comment after that, I will return for what questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, so, are there any comments from the public <clears throat> about this? Okay. Emily Dodson, good evening. Good evening. Um, yeah, so, um, City Council, Mayor Brophy, um, thank you for. Uh, viewing this amendment. Uh, we wanted to just briefly say thank you so much to um, everyone at the city who has worked uh, so well with us on this. Um, uh, not NEDCO, you're not NEDCO anymore, but y'all have worked so well, well, so well with us. Um, we were able to attend the governor's forum um, and just to see the things that the city has in place for sm small business has been a really cool experience. Um, my husband and I both uh, grew up in Nacogdoches. I joke that we're lifers, uh, we're here for the long haul. Um, so it's exciting for us to see something that um, will offer positive development to Nacogdoches. Um, we wanna see growth here. Um, potentially one day, if this goes well, be able to offer jobs to the Nacogdoches area. Um, I recently did some work with the SFA Center for Professional Development um, and a comment was made uh, at one of their new professor orientations um, that, oh my gosh, you don't have recycling here. So I think even seeing the, that kind of reach, um, that it can affect the type of professionals that we bring into the city, the type of industries, um, you know, it's 2019 and I think that's something that uh, people are looking for in a city that they want to live in is recycling service. So we want to see Nacogdoches grow and thrive um, and this is the first step for that. So thank you all so much. Oh, I'm Emily Dodson, sorry. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? Okay. Council, questions, comments for Ms. Trace? Make sure I understand the, uh, the fee is only if you're a hauler, right? That's correct. And, and that's, that's a great question. That was something that we had quite a bit of discussion is that we didn't want to have create some prohibition or some thought process that, oh gosh, if I'm going to go take my cardboard to the, the new cardboard masher that Steve has out at the landfill, or if I'm going to take my bottles to the bottle ears or whatever effort I might have, oh golly, this is coming from my house, but I've got to go do this permitting process and go get insurance and pay a $250 permit fee. So, so no, if you generate, that's a great question, Council Member Bolden, if you generate it at your house or at your business, then you can, you can 
transferring. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Putrescible attachments. Yes. Mm -hmm. I did not expect to hear that tonight. Putrescible attachments. How often do you get to say that? You just don't. It's the first time ever. You, you don't get it to say that. It might be the last time. Yeah. You might yeah. tell Holly later and that's it. <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate that the, the market for a lot of the recyclable material is tanked, and so that's made it really tricky. I've talked to Steve at length about that and how difficult it would be mm -hmm. for us as a city to do that. But I'm pro-free market, and I love mm -hmm. the opportunity that uh, you all have taken to reach out and try to do this because there is a market there I, I saw just watching what happened on social media that's that's exciting so evidently there is a pretty substantial number of people that are longing for some sort of an opportunity even if it is the city that it isn't the city rather that can provide that so thank y'all and I just I wanted to echo that thanks for that chutzpah to, to get going and and do something about the issue and also thank you to city staff for responding so quickly and efficiently to it um, did the the new the amendments I guess in the creation of a new article um, was that modeled on any um, other cities amendment or did that come from your brilliant brain well I, I, I am Jefferson Davis, not Thomas Jefferson, and so um, Franken, Frankensteinish or not, this was. Uh, the, and, and, and let me say this: uh, kudos to the Dodsons. Uh, I appreciate their. I tell you, their some of their thought processes are definitely reflected in this, um, and I appreciate their entrepreneurial spirit, and it's 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 really infectious. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't thank Steve Bartlett, Larissa Philpott, Amy Mahaffey, Anna Middlebrook, and the leadership of Jim Jeffers um, on this to create this document. Um, I think I looked at seven different cities and I stopped looking and I could not find anything on point. And so what we did look is at some cities, I think that probably would very much like to have our situation with our landfill and how that's managed, but, but don't that do some commercial hauling of certain types, but only from businesses. And so we could not, there was not anything on point, um, but we did read from those seven other cities. And, and um, Mr. Bartlett, I, I appreciate, uh, we sat down and he generated a very good list that then we went over with the Dodsons and then um, between Larissa and Amy and, and Anna was very helpful. Everybody just kind of pitched in, and so uh, they gave me their ideas, and, and this is what we came up with. Well, I would uh, also like to uh, thank the Dodsons and thank city staff for all the hard work and working toward uh, this. Um, I guess my only question um, for you is, and I apologize if I missed this in in your uh, riveting presentation <laughs> earlier. Um, Probably won't be able to sleep tonight. <laughs> is there a component um, in the new language that will require any applicable state or federal um, permitting in there? I may have missed that. I, that's because I don't think I specifically addressed it. I may have bumped up against it as far mm -hmm. as the, the site that they they ultimately transport it to having mm -hmm. to be regulated. Absolutely, I, but I should have. That is covered, um, is that they have to satisfy uh, state and federal regulations, and, and that would, if, if one failed to do that, that would be grounds for um, yeah. suspension or or. Yeah. or revocation app okay. absolutely and and we talked and, and I, I should have mentioned this as well and in, um, in, in working on this we talked uh, directly uh, with representatives of TCEQ uh, there is some permitting uh, for this level of and I don't want to say lower lower level or more basic level but more streamlined level maybe yeah. that's a better way to put it uh, for a for a, a recyclable hauler um, but uh, those have to be satisfied. I know the Dodsons have, have worked diligently to uh, to satisfy the state requirements. Great question, but yes, it is in there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this is a great step. Uh, many of us have been waiting for. So thank you very much. Okay, um, council, if there, anyone would like to make a motion. I will make a motion to approve the ordinance amending Chapter 82 Solid Waste as referred to in Agenda Item Number 13 
and um, creating article four also as referred to in agenda item number 13. I will second that. Okay. Uh, it has been moved and seconded that we uh, approve uh, agenda item number 13 as it is presented. And uh, if no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. Agenda item number 14, consider selection of a firm I'm sorry? I guess 13A. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. So we have agenda item 13A. Consider bid award for 2019 street paving project. Mr. Bartlett, did he? Didn't Mayor, mean to. You, you almost knocked me out, didn't you? <laughs> Mayor Council, Steve Bartlett, City Engineer. Uh, on August 21st, we received bids for our 2019 paving project. Uh, we talked to you a few months earlier about what streets to put into this, as you recall. So we went away and crafted a package to uh, go out to bids. And that, like I say, was done on August 21st. Um, we were fortunate that once we kind of refined our budgets, we were able to actually add two streets to the package in addition to what we told you. And they were two streets that were next on our list. And so we just kind of went in order and didn't bring those back to you. We just tried to see what kind of pricing we got. We have come in budget. As you may recall, we have two purses of funding. One is our street maintenance fee, the $5 water bill money. And the other is our normal CIP budget, which is $250,000. That's in addition to the $250,000 Mr. Jefford showed you that's actually departmental budget. So we have both. So in this case, uh, we were able to do nine streets total, <clears throat> eight of those streets come out of the uh, CI, uh, the street maintenance fee and one street comes out of the CIP budget. So again, just to refresh your memory, uh, we were able to do Post Oak Road, one that we added, uh, Sir Gwain and Wood Creek, another one we added that was previously removed from a project that was over budget. Um, and we we're doing Friar Tuck, Chevy Chase, Hillview, Lake Street and Sir Galahad. So these are all streets that are in really bad repair. Now different from what we did last year where we did a lot of surface treatment, a lot of surface coating, these are actually some major rebuilds. So we get to do a lot less streets for a lot more money because we're really reconstructing the streets and these streets needed it. So we're going to try to kind of alternate our monies and build bad streets and then try to cover a bunch of streets. So this is our year to build bad streets. So we only received two bids. Uh, the low bidder was uh, LS Equipment Company, uh, which has also been known as Lone Star Equipment Company, and they're out of Henderson. They have We have not had experience working with them, but uh, Case uh, talked about six different references, including TxDOT, some other cities, and some engineers who've also spec'd them out. So we tried to check them out best we could, and we found nothing to preclude us uh, from recommending them to you for award. So the low bid uh, from uh, Lone Star Equipment was in the amount of $988,316. And again, this is actually two bid schedules. One came from the street maintenance fee and one the other. So we just have one contractor and they'll invoice us separately so we can track the funds is how we do that. So uh, we're really excited. We were able to do the uh, much requested Pearl Street. And so we uh, had enough money to actually add a whole nother block on that. So we're gonna try to attack Pearl Street in a couple of pieces. Uh, it's such a long and huge project. So we were glad to be able to get as much as that done. So uh, at this point, uh, we'll be ready to award and start immediately if you so approve. And after public comment, I'll be able, happy to answer questions. Thank you. Is there anyone here that would like to comment on this? Council, questions for Mr. Bartlett? No. Mr. Okay. Uh, Chair will entertain a motion for approval. All right. Oh, I got to go to the <laughs> amendment. <laughs> oh, uh, agenda item 13A. A. I make a motion to approve as a bid award for 2019 Sweet pay, uh, Paving Project. I'll second. Okay, moved and seconded that we approve agenda item 13A. Uh, if no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. And agenda item, item number 14, consider selection of a firm to perform executive search and recruiting services for the position of city manager. Mr. Pearl, good evening. Mayor, Council, Stephen Pearl, Human Resources Director. I do have a handout. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. All right. So what I just handed out is the, the score sheets and the average of all those scores that you all turned in. So um, I'm not sure you all would like to discuss those a little more in detail in a minute, but I'm going to give a brief overview of where we're at and what we've done so far. So... Um, as we all know, city manager has submitted his retirement letter, and uh, his retirement date, I believe, is still January 31st of next year. And at the June 18th council meeting, um, you all approved uh, for the city to send out a request for, for proposals for a firm to provide uh, executive search and recruiting services for the position of city manager. Um, so on July 10th, we had all that together, and we sent that out, sent out the request to all interested in qualified firms who uh, wanted to give us a response. And at the submission deadline, we did receive three proposals. Um, one of those was from Baker Tilly, CPS, HR Consulting, and then Strategic Governmental Resources. And um, you all were provided a copy of that each one of those in the email and I do have a paper copy of any if any of y'all would like a paper copy to review any of those um, I know Mr. Anderson said he really enjoyed reading through all those <laughs> um, so each of you have read the RFPs um, and scored each of each of them um, and the proposal uh, the scoring was based on qualifications and experience rates and expenses um, the project timeline project design and method methodology and uh, the references and so now before you you each have the uh, average scores from what you all submitted um, and strategic government or governmental resources averaged the high score at 90.4 followed by Baker Tilly at 70 um, the city has used um, uh, SGR strategic governmental resources in the past for a, a couple of different things and had great success, had no issues with them. Um, and so tonight you are welcome just to discuss um, and or select a for firm to perform the executive search for the recruiting services for the position of city manager. Uh, there is no obligation to select any of these firms. Um, and you also have the, uh, you also may request to talk with or interview any of the firms that have submitted a uh, proposal so with that if you have any questions I'll be happy to do my best to answer them um, and we'll go from there okay thank you uh, is there any public comment on this before council uh, begins discussing okay hearing none council anyone like to start I'm okay with my selection okay <laughs> and that's SGR <laughs> yeah. is that correct yeah okay Anyone have any? Can I abstain and protest on this whole thing? <laughs> yeah. um, I'm with her on that. <laughs> um, do we see any um, utility in interviewing? I mean, since it seems like the, the consensus is SGR. Well, they seem to me to be uh, the most experienced, especially with what we're looking for, the very similar uh, situations I do have a question if we're allowed to choose uh, they have quite a few recruiters and are we allowed to choose a recruiter or recruiters you know if we get to visit yes I, I did them? I did speak with them and it, it does kind of depend on that recruit if you have a, sp a special person in mind their availability so if they're working on other ones then they may not be available but yes you would have input on who they select to kind of uh, had the uh, recruitment efforts. So, so. If it, let's just say, for example, if we invited them to come visit with us, um, because I would like to visit with them before we actually sign a contract, mm -hmm. um, they could bring a couple of people and we could get a feel for that working relationship. I'm sure they would be able to do that. Uh, they did. And sorry, I oh, didn't no, mean to interrupt. Right, no. They did put somebody in the packet, but like I said, yes. I did reach out to them and said, hey, if they wanted to use someone else, um, oh, they said yes, they would be able to do that. So. Okay. Would that like be that. a fee that we would uh, pay for lodging, food, et cetera, travel? As far as the, um, 
to get their business. I, I don't, I didn't see anything in there for that. I know they mentioned that if, if the choices that they sent us, if they wanted to come do a visit, we would pay that, but I didn't know if we would pay the re research price. Yes, I don't remember reading that, um, and we'll double, we could double check all that, but, yeah. but yes, you are right. If, when it got towards the end for the candidates, um, then in theirs, the city would be responsible for the lodging and, and travel and stuff like that on the individual candidates. I would hope that maybe we could try to arrange something before our next meeting so that we don't have to visit with them you know, late after a workshop or something like that. Is, do you think that's um, enough time within the next two weeks to try to arrange something? I would think so. Um, I will get on the phone with them tomorrow. Well, if that's, that's, who if that's the consensus of the council. Mm -hmm. that, that's just my suggestion. Yes. I just feel like time is moving and yes. we need to yeah. go ahead and try to get started on this. Mr. Hens, what are any th other thoughts you have? I, I liked uh, SGR. I liked uh, Baker, Baker Tilly to some extent too. I, I put a heavy emphasis on the Texas centric uh, workload that they've mm -hmm. shown in the last couple of years. I feel like that's pretty critical. Um, I was going to make a joke, but I won't. East, <laughs> East, East Texas is different than Maine or New York or anything else by a long yeah. shot. So California. I think we want to have um, as much networking intrastate as possible. And so I, th that's why I. I Pretty heavily skewed them, in my opinion, on the the experience because experience in California is one thing, which is one of them was really heavy. Uh, CPS, I guess, was really heavy in California, and that just didn't do a whole lot for me because the network is pretty mm -hmm. tight here, from what it sounds like. So we want to be able to tap into that. Yeah, I, I mean, I I chose them, and not I did not know that we had used them before, mm -hmm. but doing the research past what we had received in the brochures were, is the way that I chose them. And, w and we have also used CPS, um, <coughs> HR consulting for a recent training that we did with the employees. So they were not just the only ones we've used. So, so what else do you need from us if we want to try to set a meeting up with them? Is there anything else you need from us? Um, if I guess we make us, um, you all make a selection tonight if that's what you would like to do, and then. Uh, if it is y'all's will to have them at the next council meeting, I will try to get that set up. Um, if you, you would like to interview or get the process started then, um, I guess just direction from you all on how to proceed from here. Um, I was. I think we were, it, it, it would be nice to try to meet with them before the next council mm -hmm. meeting if oh, okay. possible. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, and that way we could approve a contract at the next council meeting. Is Or we could sign the contract. We could, Mr. Davis, yes, we can sign the contract when we meet with them, or does it need to be in the, it needs to be approved in the council meeting? Well, we, you, I guess there's several ways to go about it. Um, we have it on our agenda tonight for the selection of a firm, okay. consider the selection. Um, you know, if you would like, if, if the decision of the council tonight is to meet with these individuals before you make an official selection, then um, you could certainly do that, but we would have to uh, certainly adhere to Open Meetings Act um, as, as, as far as that decision, and, and the ultimate decision would have to be made at a, a properly formed meeting. Okay. Per perhaps just a suggestion. If, if we were to, if we're in consensus that we, we do want SGR, really what we're trying to accomplish is determine which recruiter we want, right? Because if that's the case, then that wouldn't be an open meetings act. That's really more of a uh, personality clash. Like if we have somebody that comes in and they don't know Nacogdoches from Dallas, then we'd make a request intra whoever we chose. Mm -hmm. you, you, you could, you know, and that's a good point, and, and I certainly don't want to, to sway one way or the other because if it's the, if it's the desire of council to meet first before making a selection, then certainly that's one path. If based on uh, your scoring uh, and your review and your discussion tonight that no, the SGR is the one that, that you feel that that is the one that you want uh, to select, you, you could. Um, as far as any selection then within of who the specific recruiter might be, then that would be another decision underneath that 
but that decision would probably still require the satisfaction of, of the Open Meetings Act. Okay. Madam Mayor, it would be helpful if the council would say like Tuesday, Thursday of next week, can you meet at 5.30 or whatever time? And then if you can, then that helps Mr. Pearl mm -hmm. to schedule SGR Certainly. to come. It would be listed on the agenda to approve the contract then, and then you can, that you interview them, have mm -hmm. your discussions, mm -hmm. talk about recruiter, mm -hmm. and then at the end, then you can approve the contract or say no, thank you, go home. Mm -hmm. I, I think that we're all feeling favorably towards them. I think this is a new experience for all of us. None of us have ever hired or been involved with hiring a city manager. And we don't want to be. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so taking this, um, uh, our, uh, we're being a little timid um, in this, but I think uh, they will, I mean, we will, I'm sure, select them. But I like that suggestion. Does, mm -hmm. does that sound or, good? Um, okay. Since they did list the executive recruitment team, are there individuals y'all would like me to request when we look to set up that meeting? Um, I would like someone, I know they have former city managers, <laughs> and I would like to, I think a part of the team would be maybe a retired or, you know, city manager that yes. it, from East Texas that okay. understands East Texas as a part of the team. Um is that mm -hmm. okay? And I don't know who all they have to choose from. There's East, a mug group. East Texas area retired. Sure. Gotcha. Sure. I know they have a couple um, that have good experience like that. Uh, okay. Tuesday, so, Thursday. Um, Give us both days. I can't can. Thursday. I'm speaking. All right, so Tuesday, everybody available Tuesday. I don't know. What time are we looking at? Your decision. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be an evening meeting if you don't want to. Okay. Oh, one o'clock on. I'm available. I'm available. Mm -hmm. I can do it at two on. At two? Yeah. At two or like two thirty would be cut. ideal. Ideal. I would assume also for the the person coming earlier would be better, but uh, if they have to travel. Yeah, so Mr. Pearl can talk to them. Mm -hmm. Pick a time okay. two after early is better. Okay. And then we'll post it as a special session. Okay. Good, two thirty Tuesday. Good. Tenth. Okay. So, do they need to make a decision with SGR first? Do we need to do table or, this agenda uh, you, item? You, you could either table it, or if somebody was so inclined, you could make a motion to instruct Mr. Pearl to uh, invite representative from SGR group uh, to meet with council Tuesday. This coming Tuesday. Someone can just echo. <laughs> I'd, just I'd, like, I'd like to make a motion, Mr. Pearl, if you would please line up a meeting mm -hmm. next Tuesday, the 10th, in the afternoon, ideally around 2.30, for a representative for SGR to join us for a special executive session or work session? Executive session. No, special no, session. Council meeting. Mm -hmm. It cannot be done. In it's a special meeting. That, that's right. For a special city council meeting. Got it. I need a second, please. Second. I will second that. Okay. Uh, any other discussion? Not all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. Um, executive session? Yes, ma'am. We have several items. No. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you for uh, your attendance tonight. Thank you, Council, for your participation. And our meeting for September 3rd is adjourned.